Hello and welcome to our service. Uh, my name is Jim Conkle and I'm the associate pastor of our Jennersville campus and the pastor of our Celebrate Recovery community. And I'm so glad you're joining us today. And if you're watching us for the first time, or maybe you've just recently joined our online community, we would love to know who you are. And so would you take a moment, visit our website and click the I'm new button. You'll learn a little bit more about who we are. And while you're there, fill out the connections card. Tell us how we might help you get connected into our church family. Now, I don't know about you, but I can sense spring all around me, right? You can just feel it in the air, can't you? You can smell it in the air. You can feel the warmer days and the flowers beginning to emerge. And all of this reminds us of the indescribable beauty and majesty of God's creation. You know, Psalms 19 says it this way, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And so in that spirit, would you join us as we worship our God, hear a testimony from Katie Davis, and wrap up our first Peter series with a message from our lead pastor, Greg Lafferty. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea,
The best way I can like describe it is it's like having your own personal marching band that's following you around all the time. But instead of playing instruments, they're just repeating all the, you know, awkward or embarrassing things that you say or do all the time and just telling you, you know, the reasons that people shouldn't want to be your friend. My name is Katie Davis, and I've been coming to Willowdale for about two years. I was born into a Christian family, grew up in the church, so I had a relationship with Jesus from a very young age. I actually remember like kneeling down by my bedside and praying the prayer, and um, I remember thinking I had to kneel because that's you know what all like the precious moments figurines did. So yeah, that moment is very vivid. I had this understanding that he was my friend. I actually used to like talk to him out loud on the school bus when um, the one girl that I sat next to who I was friends with would get off and I felt lonely. So I'd just start talking to him or I would pretend to push him on the swing set on the playground, which, you know, it sounds cute in theory, but hindsight probably just looks like a scene out of a horror movie. Um, but yeah, so I just understood that, you know, my relationship with God was personal from a young age. Anxiety is something that I've pretty much always struggled with, even as a kid. And so it just has manifested in different ways. It has affected my relationships with people. I just find myself, you know, tending to overthink like conversations or texts. You know, like if someone doesn't reply to me for a while, my first thought isn't, oh, this person is probably busy, they'll get back to me. When they can, it's like, oh, like, what did I do wrong? Or, oh, this person like must, you know, not want to be my friend anymore. In middle school, I had gone to a small Christian school. Pretty much everyone there knew me, I knew everyone. And you know, I had struggles with friendships, like most middle schoolers do. And so when I transitioned to high school, I started going to a public school for the first time. And I was actually really excited for that um, change because, you know, I saw it as an opportunity to make new friends and kind of reinvent myself. But I have a history of uh, big changes or transitions tend to be a trigger for me with my anxiety. Um, and this was probably the biggest change that I'd ever had until that point. Pretty much, I was so anxious about, you know, just wanting to make new friends to the point that it just consumed me and made it hard just to have like any conversation. I made very few friends that year and I ended up just spiraling into a depression that lasted for the rest of that year and really just lost all sense of who I was. Um, I'd always kind of had a reputation as someone who was really happy and got along with everyone and that just wasn't um, who I felt like anymore. And eventually just reached a point in college where I started to understand that at the root of that anxiety was just this fear um, of not being loved by people. And so pretty much just lived in constant fear that at some point the people in my life um, were just gonna realize that I was not good enough for them and were gonna leave me. And so I was just living out of that fear all the time. So being rooted in truth is a very huge thing that I'm, I'm learning to do. There was um, a verse that I came across while I was in college. I was just reading 1 John 4 for a devotional that I had on a retreat. And I'm sure I'd read this verse before in my life, but it just really, really hit me in a new way. So the verse is 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Therefore, the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. And so the first time I read it, when I was very much in the thick of, you know, struggling with that anxiety and with, you know, my relationships, that verse was really comforting because it was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to be afraid of not being loved by people because God's love for me is enough and I can rest in that. And that's absolutely true. But as I have gotten older and really come to understand more of the context of that verse, I've realized that really what it's saying is that because of God's love for me, I don't have to be afraid of Him. 
When I was 24 and was just really like struggling with where I was at in life, I remember I felt like I was letting God down, like that I had disappointed him. You know, I read that verse, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. It's just this reminder that, you know, God showed his love for me on the cross through Jesus. And so all of the mistakes that I make or, you know, the ways that I sin or, you know, even just the things that I'm disappointed in in myself, um, God doesn't hold those things against me. When I was struggling with anxiety, I very much found my identity in like the things that I was insecure about. So, you know, whether that was my anxiety itself or my body image, my income level, things that I had done in my past, like hurtful words that I had spoken to people. There was a point in college where I was really trying to cope with anxiety in some pretty unhealthy ways involving alcohol. And so there was a lot of, you know, shame and regret with that. But as I root my sense of identity in who God says that I am, that that is, that's permanent. And so the things that he tells me about myself are permanent. And that's, you know, why I can root myself in them because they're not gonna change on the days when, you know, I'm struggling with being single. I can remember that he calls me his bride or on the days when I'm struggling with just feeling like, you know, unlovable. I can remember that he calls me beloved or I'm lonely. I remember that he calls me his friend. And so it just all goes back to this beautiful friendship that um, he offers to me. Well, hey everyone, I'm so glad you're with us today, and I'm excited for what we're going to study as we wrap up our teaching series through 1 Peter, called People of Purpose in a World of Chaos. And you know, that graphic we've been showing you throughout this, uh, it really says what this is about, because there are a lot of dark forces going every which way, but there is a solid, bright, steadfast, long-suffering line and we're in it. In fact, that's why Peter has written this letter. 1 Peter 5.12, a verse we've said before and referenced before. We're going to read it in context in a few moments, but it says that I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Now, that raises a question we have not yet addressed, and that is, what is this? This is the true grace of God. What exactly? What is this? And the answer, surprisingly, is your life. Your hard, persecuted, tenuous life. This life of pain and suffering and hardship that has you just living by faith and relying on God day by day. That's what this is. Peter says, this is the way of grace. This is the true grace of God. You stand firm in it. See, Peter doesn't want any of us to think that somehow maybe the gospel has malfunctioned in our lives, that the blessing of God has somehow been lost. No, the pain and hardship of life is just proof of the fact that we've been redeemed out of this world. This fallen world is not our home. Heaven's our home. Our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. And so we have to persevere, even suffer persecution in this life. And Peter's just been saying that again and again and again. In fact, by way of review, I want to just take you to a couple of verses in every chapter that tease out this theme in chapter one. Now for a little while, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's your praise and glory and honor. That's what's in the offing here. In chapter two, Peter says, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so you may follow in his steps. Chapter three says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless, 
For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. He says a moment later, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. It's a promise. And in chapter four, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. No, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And so you see the flow. You see the pattern. You see the path that God has marked out for us. It's suffering followed by glory. It's hardship followed by happiness. It's the cross followed by the crown. And it's not just that these things come in sequence, you know, there's an ebb and flow to life, kind of the yin and yang of good and evil. No, it's not just a sequence. It's a consequence. It's the suffering that produces the glory. It's bearing the cross that takes us to the crown. As it was for Jesus, it'll be for us, right? Philippians 2. Jesus became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God raised him and exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. It's going to go the same way for us. Acts 14, 22 says it's through many hardships or many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. So when life is hard, don't think the gospel's malfunctioning. No, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And as Peter wraps up the letter and takes us through some concluding words, he actually not only underscores this again, but he gives us really the secrets and the keys for how to stand firm in our present trials. So we'll see this as we go. First Peter 5, I'm going to pick up on in verse 5, the end of verse 5, and then read through to the end. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then the postscript. By Sylvanus, a dear, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I've written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. The end, Peter says. I've written to you by Sylvanus. That, by the way, is probably the full proper name of Silas. Pretty well-known New Testament character. Compatriot of both Paul and Peter. Kind of the Sam Gamshi to their Frodo. I've written to you by Silas. I send you greetings from she who's at Babylon. Probably a coy way of referring to the church at Rome. Babylon is long gone and passed off the scene, but Babylon is like the archetypal image of worldly power and pride. The seat of that's in Rome now, and the bride of Christ is in Rome as well. So she who's at Babylon sends you greetings, and, and so does Mark. Mark, the, the writer of the New Testament Gospel of Mark, which is really Peter's story as told to Mark. Peter says, you know, greetings from these and and hey, you greet one another with the kiss of love. That's just, you know, the ancient Italian way of greeting, a Hollywood peck on each cheek. And by the way, if you want to be like uber literal and practice that officially, I welcome you to do it. But just so you do it the biblical way and the ancient way, and that is same sex kisses only, guys. 
which is probably why we prefer handshakes and bro hugs, right? So that's the end of the letter. But now let's get to the real heart of the matter here. Peter said, as we've said once again, this is the true grace of God. This is what we're talking about today, the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. How? He's actually told us how. How to stand firm in it in, in the, the basic interlocking hard circumstances of life. How do we stand firm in the pain, in the fear, and in the wait? You know, the waiting, as that great theologian Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. How do we stand firm in these situations? Well, Peter breaks it down for us. He says, in the pain, stand firm by humbling yourself and casting all your cares on the Lord. Peter says that you humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. Your circumstance right now might feel heavy. That's because God's mighty hand is on you. This is a, a beautiful and powerful biblical image, the mighty hand of God. Sometimes that hand is extended to like redeem and rescue. Like when God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. He saved them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. But sometimes that hand is just heavy upon us. David talks like this. Job talks like this. The, hand, the Lord's hand was heavy upon me. It's not yet the hand that, you know, rescues and delivers. It's more like the hand that's restraining and, and disciplining. Have you ever felt like God's hand is heavy upon you? You know God's in it. You know God has brought these circumstances about. It's not so much that you feel abandoned by God. It's just like chastened by him. His hand is heavy on you. You know he's in it. You know he's working. But that doesn't make it pleasant or happy. In fact, it kind of stinks. When my mom passed away about 18 months ago and you know, talking to my dad a lot and always checking in and how are things with you, dad? How's your soul? He, he told me numerous times, well, I was just telling the Lord again, this stinks. And you know what? That is a perfectly fine thing to do. That's what a man of faith does when he's under God's heavy hand. You say, this stinks. You know, I don't like this. We got all kinds of Psalms that give voice to that. And at the same time, as you kind of groan, under God's mighty hand, you're, you're humbling yourself there and, and you're casting all your cares, all your anxieties on him. That's how you stand firm in the pain. You treat God as real. And even though his hand is heavy on you, you know that he's also the God of, of a loving, mighty heart. And that in due season, that mighty hand is going to rescue and deliver you and lift you up. And so you're just going to cast all your cares and your anxieties on him. I read a story recently uh, by Kathy Keller, Tim Keller's wife. Uh, she shares the story. Not sure she said whether it's like a true story or just kind of a fable, but um, it's a story of a lumberjack who uh, was going in to clear a, a field of trees that were ready for harvest. And just as he's getting ready to cut down the first tree, he sees a, a beautiful bird up in that tree just beginning to build a nest. Well, he doesn't want any harm to come to this bird, so he like makes a bunch of noise and pounds the tree with the flat side of his axe, and of course the bird flies off, flies to the next tree, starts doing her work again. Lumberjack goes to the next tree, makes some noise, starts pounding on that, scares the bird off. This goes on for about a half an hour. This lumberjack chasing the bird from tree to tree until finally, frustrated, the bird flies away, goes up onto an outcropping of rocks on the side of the hill and begins to build her nest there. That's the safe place. And that's exactly what God is doing with us. He wants us to build our house on the rock and so often in the painful places of life, he's teaching us how to do that more and more. He's teaching us faith. He's teaching us trust. He's removing all the other foundations of our lives, all the other things we've been nesting on. And he's putting us solidly on the rock, 
on the kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so how do we, how do we you know, live faithfully? How do we stand firm in this hard way of grace? Just keep casting our anxieties on him, casting all our cares on him. That, that word for cares or anxieties carries the idea of the, the things that would pull us apart, the things that would separate us. Sometimes the things that just open up gaping wounds in our hearts. Sometimes the things that you know, would threaten to, it would feel like separate us from the love of God or separate us from this life of faith. Now think about Peter. He knew a little bit of what this was about. Remember before Jesus' trial and crucifixion, Jesus said to Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. There's a heavy test coming. God's got a plan for it, but so does Satan. He wants to separate you from faith. I'm not going to let that happen, Jesus says. No, you you keep praying. You keep casting your cares on me. You keep depending on me. And it won't be the faith that's separated from you. It'll be the anxiety that's separated from you. Of course, Peter initially failed that test. He fell asleep in the garden when he should have been praying and seeking God's help and God's strength. We can learn from that. We keep casting every care and anxiety on God. Yes, his hand is heavy upon us, but his heart is full for us. And in due time, he is going to lift us up. That's how we stand firm in the pain. What about in the fear? And I take this from verse 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You got to resist him. You got to be firm in your faith. You know, the lion roars in order to intimidate and frighten his opponent. And that is certainly what our enemy, the devil, will do for us. Let's first recognize and remember that there is an enemy. There is a Satan. There are demonic forces in the spiritual realms. And they are arrayed against God and arrayed against us, God's children. And there is nothing that the enemy would love to do more in hardship, especially, you know, that that real painful kind of hardship, like persecution, war. He just wants to terrify us. He wants us to cower before him. We don't do that. We stand firm and resist him. This is the difference of nuance between, say, something that's just the pain and something that is the fear. You know, in the pain, when we're under God's mighty hand, we get small. You know, we we get small before God. We humble ourselves. We might kneel before him. We might feel small because we're like laid out, we're bedridden, we're homebound. That's what we do in relationship to God, but not in relationship to Satan. When he roars and he attempts to terrify us and frighten us, we stand tall and firm. You know, it's like predators. There are some predators that present themselves. You do not run. If you run, like they smell fear, they're going to chase you down. No, you stand your ground. You get big before them. You make some noise. You resist and they flee. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches us to do. When Satan himself would threaten to undo us, would want to terrify us, we do not cower before him. No, we resist him the way Jesus did. Jesus, when presented with awful temptations of Satan in the wilderness, He faced him down with the word of God. He drew the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and he just quoted scripture at the devil. That's what we do. Ephesians 6 tells us that we get suited up in the full armor of God, and that includes the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and the helmet of salvation and all the rest. And then we pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer. We stand lifting up holy hands in prayer like the men of our church are doing these days. And we resist him and he flees from us. James 4 lays that out directly. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's how we stand firm in the fear. We do not cower, we do not flee. But now let me throw this in as a sidebar because does that mean that it's always wrong to flee? I mean, when you're 
my goodness, our, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, no doubt thousands are fleeing for their lives. Others are staying where they are, caring for their wounded neighbors, some of them fighting the good fight against the Russians. Which is right to do? Well, we actually have some wonderful wisdom to tap into on that. Uh, from, from the great John Bunyan, you know, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. He was a pastor and a writer in England in the 1600s during a time of great persecution. Bunyan himself went to prison for his faith, and he heard, urged others in his flock to stand firm and resist when persecuted. But then some people like raised questions because, you know, Bunyan was so sure of God's sovereignty through it all. It's like, no, we stay put. We don't flee. Well, some raise a question like, may we not fly in a time of persecution? You're pressing upon us that persecution is ordered and managed by God makes us afraid to fly. And so Bunyan, he wrote in, in a little tract called Seasonable Counsel or Advice for Sufferers. He said, I can't tell you not to fly. Only you can tell. I wouldn't want to bind your conscience saying it's always, you know, wrong to fly. Um, in fact, he says, you know, you look at Bible characters and sometimes the same person in a different circumstance fled or stood. Moses, he flew and he stood. David, sometimes he fled, sometimes he stood his ground. Paul, sometimes fled, sometimes stood his ground. I can't tell you what to do. But Bunyan says this, I can give you some piece of, uh, pieces of advice. He says, you know, if you do fly, take some counsel. One, do not fly out of slavish fear. Make sure that's not the motive. Two, if you fly, do as much good as you can while you go. Three, do not think yourself secure when you have fled. You do not know what providence has in store. He goes on to say, number four, so if apprehended, Take it as God now making more clear your calling to suffer. And five, if apprehended, do not be offended at God, for you are his servant, and your life and your all are his. And then finally he says, if you've fled and escaped, laugh. And if you're caught, laugh. I mean, be pleased whichever way things go, for the scales are still in God's hand. It's all still in God's hand, so you rejoice in the Lord always. If you fled to safety, laugh. If you flee and you're apprehended, laugh. God is in control. That's how we stand firm in the fear. Now, what about in the wait? The waiting, the hardest part. Well, I want you to look at verse 10 with me, and I just want you to see and savor this verse. In the wait, we stand firm by believing in the promises of God. And uh, 1 Peter 5.10 is just one of the greatest promises in the whole of Scripture. I encourage you to memorize this verse, make it yours, make it a weapon, you know, at your side, the sword of the Spirit, and uh, let it guard your heart and your mind. Let's just break this thing down real slow and savor this verse. It says, after you have suffered a little while, that might be a day or a week, that might be a month or a year, that might be decades or a lifetime. In light of eternity, it's still a little while. And there's a promise that after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace. Just pause on that. The God of all grace, all 31 flavors, every hue in the Sherman Williams paint factory, the God of all grace, who has a particular grace flavored and colored exactly for your need, he's going to do something for you. He himself who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. By the way, that's a great destination. Your destiny is not death. It's not despair. It's not isolation. Your destiny is eternal glory and the God of all grace himself is going to act on your behalf. You know, there are great statements in the Bible about what God himself will do. 
just underscores God's personal involvement. God himself is doing it. He's not delegating this to anybody, not even like the archangel Michael. No, God himself is doing this. Whenever you read that, pay attention. There's some awesome statements in the Bible, by the way. I mean, the Lord himself will go before you, the Bible says. The Lord himself will fight for you. The God of peace himself will sanctify you thoroughly. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we really are the children of God. Revelation 21 says that one day God himself will be with us and we'll be, he'll be his God, our God, and we'll be his people. God himself is going to be with us, unmediated presence. And here it says, he himself, after we've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, himself is going to do four things for us. One, he's going to restore us. He's going to make us whole again. This word restore is the exact opposite of the word for care or anxiety. The things that threaten to pull us apart. Restore is God putting us back together again. It's actually the same word used famously in the Gospels when Jesus first meets his disciples by the shores of the Sea of Galilee and they're mending their nets. They're they're bringing their nets that have holes in them back into wholeness, back together again. That's what restoration is. God's going to restore us. He's going to make us whole and complete without holes in our souls. We're getting fixed, y'all, thoroughly in every single way. There's not going to be any like post-traumatic stress. There's not going to be any lingering syndromes. We're not going to need the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders in heaven. Hey, I I don't believe in burning books. But I'll be glad to see that book go up in flames someday because there will be no need for it. The only thing we might diagnose and try to get statistics on is like, how much of the fruit of the Spirit do we have? You know, like I imagine like Peter standing there with all of us when we arrive on the shores of heaven, like, anybody got a bad case of loving you right now? Yeah? How bad? Like, man, I got it bad. Like, all I feel is love right now. How about joy? Anybody beside themselves with joy? And we're all jumping up and down saying, like, I'm like coming out of my skin for happiness right now. Anybody got peace like a river? It's like the Amazon is flowing through my soul. Well, all right then, I think we're ready. Let's get on with heaven. And it's just up and to the right from there. God, the God of all grace, will himself restore us and confirm us. Confirm that we're really his. Confirm that we're really not crazy. Confirm that when we banked our lives and eternities on him, that was a very, very good bet and investment. Because you're coming into your own now, which is all of the kingdom and God himself. He's going to confirm that that was the best decision you ever made. And by the way, it came as a gift of grace. He opened your heart to put faith in him. He's going to strengthen you. God of all grace himself will strengthen you. There's going to be nothing in your life that isn't firm and strong. You're being conformed to the very image of Jesus. Does he have any personality flaws? Are there any holes in Jesus' character? Well, there won't be in yours either. And he's going to establish you. You will be steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord in this life and in the next because you're being established in a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And this is how you stand firm in the waiting. You believe this promise. And you begin to even get foretastes and experiences of it now because we're being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. We don't get all the glory in one fell swoop, although there will obviously be a quantum leap forward when we get to heaven. But it's already coming to to us in degrees. So you stand firm. This hard life, this is the true grace of God. We stand firm in it. You just cling to the old rugged cross. And the older you get, the more rugged you will become. Amen? Believe it, and God be with you this week.
Thanks for being a part of our service today. Hey, if you're new to Willowdale Online, we want you to know that we would love to meet you in person. Uh, we gather every Sunday at both campuses at 9 a.m. and 1030. And if you're considering coming and being with us in person, you can plan your visit by clicking the Omnu button on our website. If you let us know that you're coming, uh, we'll come and greet you and show you around. But we'd love for you to be with us. Also, if you haven't already done so, I want to invite you to download our app where you can access uh, all of the latest and greatest news going around here at Willowdale, as well as our weekly newsletter and read more about all the opportunities we have for everyone of all ages and stages of life to get connected into our community. So would you check that out? Let me leave you with these words. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. Have a great week.